Hello, Pankaj. Pankaj, click your, uh, what's this? You need to click your, I have a blue screen. You open up your, beside the stop video, there's an arrow. Okay, click your choose virtual background. And then create. Click the, I have a green, green screen. So that you won't be, you, because you look like a ghost on your computer screen. You're on mute, Pankaj. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Oh, okay. uh, chala liya, na. Uh, this is this is in the minimize. We need to do minimize. Uh, ten number or decision making. Ten number and decision making. Hmm. 
जब आप आ जाएंगे शेयर स्क्रीन पर नीचे करिए क्लिक करिए हाँ यह है ना शेयर स्क्रीन आप चेरी वेर आर यू गुड आफ्टरनून Good afternoon, Cherry. How are you? I'm okay, Prof, but I'm inside control, the control room, so you can see me. I can't see you. Where are you hiding in the control room? Yes, I'm hiding in a control room. Okay, should we check my presentation as you suggested? Ah, uh, Prof, you already broadcast, so. I think I think Pankaj already did a while ago. No, do you want me to, to share my screen and then we can check the polling slides? Hold on, Prof. Okay. Wait, hold on, Prof. Okay. Should I share my screen? Ah, uh, Prof, we've already broadcast. So, is it okay for you? Uh, I mean, most of the participants can see your presentation if you're going to share it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, should we just go to the the polling slides then? Do we know which are the polling slides? You can just share the polling yeah. slides. Just to make sure that the uh, polling system works, that's all. Hi, Alan. Daniel. Hey. We've got a busy day ahead, Marky. Yeah. <laughs> Look forward to it. That's fine. <laughs> Do we have polls again before each lecture? Yes, we'll have the polling just like yesterday. Okay. So I believe uh, uh, Barlin is going to. Uh, Start off the screenings, right? Yeah. So Barlin has to join, still. Yeah, Barlin will be the first one. Where are you, Alan? <laughs> Alan is hiding. <laughs> He's got multiple commitments today, just <laughs> as usual in his life. Hi, Maki. Hi, Alex. Does, sir, yeah. yung, uh, you're, you have a cherry loop pakudan as your. I oh. think you have to change your name, your profile. Uh, so okay. Let's Can you receive it. an email reminder from Zoom. Yeah, I click that. Not the one I sent. Sorry, uh, it's under my name. Okay, so I can to, so uh, okay, so I I leave first and then reconnect. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Thank you. Hello. 
So, uh, so uh, Cherry, I take it it's not required then to to check my slides, my polling slides, right? Uh, sorry, Prof, you can share now. I uh, will try. Next is not. Cherry, are you there? Yes, Prof. I'm listening. Okay. Uh, ICU 05. ICU 05. Okay. Where? 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 So with this slide, Cherry, there should be a, a polling slide that comes with this one, right? Yes, Prof. So do you have it? Because I can't see it on my screen. Yes, Prof. I got a new name. Yes. That, 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 that's, that's what I was noticing. Zero five guys. I don't know what to do. Jerry Lou. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Dr. Ralph is Cherry Lou. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know how this came. Hey, <laughs> my name. I was Cherry Lou before. I was wondering when did you get to Manila? <laughs> okay, maybe uh, I should close and open again and see. Yes, please. Uh, uh, please click the one that's sent by Zoom. The invitation sent by the Zoom. Yep. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Anil. Yeah. Uh, I've already. So I will show. I will launch now. Just this one, and I will relaunch later. You see that? Oh, well done. I need to close it now, Prof. Okay, well done, Jerry Lou. You're a champion, like I always say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna minimize all of this. And uh, stop share. Okay, two minutes to start. Is Bye. that right? <laughs> Very stringent timekeeper. Parlian, <laughs> can't deny. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. With the cane, like a hate master. <laughs> no, that, that is uh, Cherry Lu Pakudan. She is the headmistress here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what do you
you think of the background, Linda? It's uh, it's looking very colorful and very varied and uh, very attractive. It, it's 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 obviously it's it's of course better than the San Francisco, though the San Francisco was nice. But then it it looks so much more wider and nicer. Yeah. yeah so so can we do this the next time too? Oh well, we'll do exactly the same. What you have here will be the standard template uh, moving forward. So Pankaj can actually send the same one out across. This will be your standardized template for all the background. Yeah, I like it. Mm. Mm. Whatever will change from subsequent is just the face of uh, each faculties across the region and the, the change of the societies. Yeah, the Guardian is not in yet, bro. Remains Cherry Lou. <laughs> <laughs> So I have to accept it. Uh, Prof. Rao. Hi, Cherry Lou. <laughs> Prof. Cherry Lou. Yes, Prof. gender transformation. <laughs> I didn't know Cherry Lou is a little bit bald. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Prof. Rao, did you receive a, another, uh, not not the one I sent? Maybe yeah, that, that is the one from today. A reminder uh, from Zoom? The, yes, the one you have sent today. No, no. Um, I think so because that's my invitation. So that's why it's named my cherry to cherry blue. The first one. There are two mails that was sent. One, the first one is the, the one that you should click, I think. I will try the old one. Yeah. There are two succeeding. Uh, still waiting for the attendees. We still have more coming in. And also, Dr. Balian Boss. Oh, we don't have Balian as yet. So, so Maki, are you ready with with your presentation? Just in case Balian is delayed. Yes, Kuya. Okay. What, what what is the actual meaning of kuya and what is the actual meaning of ape? Elder brother and elder sister. Sorry, the old one is fine. Elder brother is kuya. Mm -hmm. Okay. Elder sister is ape. Younger uh, sister. Younger sister. Oh, no, elder. Younger. <laughs> and then I've got to be careful while using ape. <laughs> Kuya is okay. <laughs> Ape is not okay. <laughs> okay, now. Uh, okay, it's just past one thirty. So should we start then? We have Kuya Alan. Participants. Alan? I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. Four, start the 402. Uh, we'll start off. Uh, we still have at least 10 more participants. Anyway, we can start off. Uh, is Barlian in? Barlian, Barlian. Because the first lecture is from Barlian. Yeah, but then uh, if Barlian is delayed, we can have uh, Maki speak first. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's possible because number one, he's old. Second, uh, he's not a girl. <laughs> Pregnant, delayed. <laughs> uh, who will take the the part of Barlian? I can. No, if you turn up, then 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 uh, then uh, one of us can do it. But let's give him a chance. Yamaki. Yeah, I can lecture first on Liechtenstein. Okay. Yeah, we can do the open Liechtenstein repair. Anyway, uh, it's 4.03. Can we start? Sure. Anil? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the participants are 33. Okay, we're here. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, 
Thank you once again for joining us. This is the second day of the Asia-Pacific Hernia Society uh, Hernia Essentials Basic Online, the very first uh, basic online course uh, given by the Society. Again, we would like to call on uh, Professor Ralph Hartung to welcome everyone uh, to the second day of the Hernia Essentials. Ralph Hartung is the president of Asia-Pacific Hernia Society. Professor, Ralph, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, and welcome back, all of you. So I hope you enjoyed your day yesterday with the uh, first session. Today we have the second session, basically, with the techniques of hernia repair, and tomorrow the last session. So um, I hope that all of you are benefiting from this program and that you will finally then, at the end of the program, pass the MCQ and get your first basic part accredited. So good luck to all of you. And um, again, have fun today. I know it's a Friday. It's a Friday evening or afternoon. For me, it's four hours earlier because I sit in Dubai. I'm sitting in Dubai, but um, uh, I think it is worth it. So please join the lectures and um, don't hesitate to ask. You are familiar now with the chat box, so any possible question, please type it in the chat box. We will pick it up and answer these questions at the end of the session. Back to you, Alan. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, so for the second day, uh, we will have Professors uh, Jose Macari Failona, our immediate past president, and uh, Professor Anil Sharma, also a past president of the Asia Pacific Hernia Society to act as our moderator for this afternoon. Anyway, we still encourage, we would encourage all the participants, especially the 33 registrants, uh, to please, uh, we encourage you to ask your questions because this workshop, uh, this online workshop is for you. Yeah. And anyway, to keep the program uh, rolling, uh, to start it off, we'll have just a few adjustments rather than the TAPP repair for Ingrid Hernia repair. Alan, Barlian is here. Hello? Barlian is here. Hello? Hi, Barlian. Hey. Hello. Okay, we we'll give Barlian a few minutes to prepare his slide. Barlian, is it okay for you to, if we go first to uh, Maki's uh, lecture? Please, please, please. please. So you, can, please. you can prepare your slide. Anyway, okay. It, it, it okay. Of time. Anyway, so we'll have the lecture for open hernia repair. The little Okay, Ellen, you can uh, play first. Uh, Maki can uh, take uh, the repres uh, presentation first. Thank you, Professor Pilar. Anyway, we would, well, we would like to welcome Professor Rosario Ma uh, Macario Failona, the immediate past president of the Asia Pacific Hernia Society. Yeah, Maki, before your lecture. Uh, let's post first the poll, uh, the poll questions. So we have two questions for the before the lecture of Kuyamaki. Uh, the first question is: Open hernia repair will still remain the standard of care in the future. So choices are yes and no. Uh, number two, the second question is: Lichtenstein hernia repair is the gold standard for hernia repair. So participants, please uh, click on the answer and submit your answers. Is the poll complete? Can we post the, the answers? Okay. So for the first question, open hernia repair will still remain the standard of care in the future. 56% uh, said no. 44% uh, said yes. For the second uh, question, Lichtenstein uh, should be the go is the gold standard for open hernia repair. 100% said yes. Uh, this the the question, the answers to the question will be answered by the lecturer of uh, Professor Jose Macario Failono, our immediate past president. Miyamaki, thank you. Yeah, I'll share my screen now. Good afternoon to the participants. And I would like to thank uh, APHS for the opportunity for asking me to talk about the Lichtenstein technique. So, 
Good afternoon. I actually don't have any disclosures for this talk. So we all know that I work here in this hospital, who is now identified as a COVID center. So all of our hernia repairs are put at bay. So we have been doing hernia repairs for the past three months and up to now. So when talking about hernia repairs, uh, there has to be some uh, preoperative preparation that we need to do. And uh, let me go back. So there has to be patient preparation. You have to identify the predisposing factors for problems that will, take, will be with your patient and minimize them. Discuss the procedure with your patient, what, what type of technique you're going to do, including the outcomes and the possible complications. Why, why are my slides going up? Sorry about that. Okay. So the type of anesthesia that can be used for open uh, inguinal hernia repairs could be local, regional, or general anesthesia. And this is an algorithm which basically tells us the type of anesthesia will also be dependent on the type of repair that you're going to do. Anterior uh, mesh repairs can be done under local or general anesthesia or even regional. If you do a posterior repair, if it's an open one, transinguinal can be do local or general anesthesia. However, if you do it laparoscopic, then it's mandatory that it's usually general anesthesia. But of course, some reports have come in uh, using regional anesthesia as well for laparoscopic. So what is the technique for local anesthesia? We use 50 to 50 mixture of silocaine and bubivacaine. You do first about 5 ml of subdermal infiltration, followed by 3 ml of intradermal injection, then subcutaneous injection, and subaponeurotic injection, which means you inject uh, the local anesthetic beneath the external oblique aponeurosis. And then during the dissection, before you anchor the mesh to the pubic tubercle or ligate the hernial sac, you have to put some anesthetic as well at the pubic tubercle and the neck of the hernial sac. So let's talk about Lichtenstein technique. This was first proposed in 1984 by the triumvirate of Lichtenstein. That's Lichtenstein, this is Chalman, and this is Parvis Amid. Uh, they reported their series in 1989 with a very good result of zero recurrence in five years. Most of the cases were done under local anesthesia and they used 5 by 10 centimeter mesh. However, after that uh, five-year report, they found out that some occurrences came back and this was the report presented by Amid in 1998 and 2003. So they did an Amid modification for the Liechtenstein technique wherein they used a bigger size mesh because they found out that the 5 by 10 centimeter mesh contracts after quite a while and you have to allot uh, uh, mesh contraction and that's why they are advocating a bigger sized mesh. The type of suturing was also altered uh, wherein you have to do interrupted suturing in the medial side in order to prevent entrapment of the iliohypogastric nerve and then you have to observe overlaps and nerve identification is very important to avoid chronic inguinal pain. So this is the initial uh, mesh placement of the original Liechtenstein, and this is what Liechtenstein is uh, as we know today. So what are the critical steps? Use a big sized mesh, follow the overlaps. Sorry about that. Follow the overlaps. Ah, well, my slides are being difficult to control. Follow the overlaps, do the cross tails behind the spermatic cord, and then uh, the mesh is secured with a continuous suture at the inguinal ligament and two interrupted sutures at the medial side. So this is, they said that you have to put some dome shape or laxity at the middle part to uh, allow the contraction of the mesh. And this is the extensions needed, two centimeters at the pubic tubercle, three to four centimeters medially, and five to six centimeters at the cross tail. Now, about the laxity in the dome, Professor Raymond Reed and Arthur Gilbert actually questioned uh, this laxity because they found out in three cases 
that they had a recurrence and they are blaming either the laxity in the dome or due to inadequate sizing of the keyhole at the level of the internal ring. Another key thing that we have to know uh, with regards to the Lichtenstein technique is we have to know how to protect the nerves. So there are three nerves involved in this technique. The iliohypogastric nerve here, the ilioinguinal nerve, and the genital nerve. And in cadaveric specimen, these are the nerves that you see. So this is ilioinguinal, that's iliohypogastric. Sometimes you don't see the iliohypogastric because it's buried in the uh, internal oblique muscle. And the genital nerve is beneath the spermatic cord. So why Lichtenstein? Lichtenstein is probably the most studied technique in terms of inguinal hernia repair. You saw all, you see this meta-analysis, systematic reviews, randomized controlled trials. And that's why this technique is actually the one recommended uh, by the European Hernia Society and the Asia Pacific Hernia Society if you're going to do an open repair of the groin. This uh, recommendations was further um, uh, circumvented by the hernia surge guidelines, which was presented by Professor Satyen yesterday. So the guidelines, just as a summary for the diagnosis, it's important to just do a physical examination because about 90% of the cases can be diagnosed by physical exam. And only if you are doubtful that you may do an ultrasound or a dynamic MRI for doubtful cases. It is also mandatory now that we use the EHS classification. As mentioned by Professor Satyen yesterday, you have to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. The mesh-based technique is also recommended. And if it's an open one, you do Liechtenstein. And if it's uh, uh, the posterior one, you do minimally invasive tap or tap. If mesh is not feasible, the one recommended is doing the shoulder dice technique and the shoulder dice technique is also recommended if the patient refuses mesh or there's non availability of mesh or in low resource setting. However, if you're going to do a non mesh technique, this has to be a shared decision between the patient and the surgeon. What about the learning curve? The endoscopic technique is way over here. The, the Liechtenstein technique is here. You just need about 24 cases properly taught to be a master of this technique. So it's easily learned. Now, all hernia techniques will have some variations uh, proposed by surgeons. And the variations is due to either variations in fixation, variations in prosthetic material design, or modification of the technique itself. We have to be careful about these variations because according to Kings North, this actually corrupted the Bassini technique because of all of these variations. So we see now all of these uh, different types of meshes being used for open groin hernia repair. And if we're going to do some variations of the technique, this has to be tested in research studies according to efficacy, effectiveness with external validation, as well as the cost. Some evidences on the hernia surge, they looked at the three-dimensional implants and the bilayer. However, the recommendation nowadays is that it's not recommended due to the excessive foreign body and the use of other implants to replace the standard flat mesh in the Liechtenstein technique is, of course, not currently recommended. And if we're going to do an open preperitoneal mesh, the recommendation is that it is suggested to be performed only in research settings. And still, the Liechtenstein technique is the one recommended for the open one. Prosthetic materials, we have this, uh, issues in the weight, heavyweight and lightweight, porosity, absorbable and partially absorbable meshes. And I think Alan will talk more about this tomorrow. So just to su uh, suffice to say that if as hernia surgeons, if we're going to use a particular mesh, we have to be aware of the intrinsic characteristic of the meshes that we use. Take a look at the evidence and make sure that you are doing justice to your patient by using this particular prosthetic material. With regards to heavyweight and uh, lightweight, it's not really clear as the, at the moment as to the evidences with, with regards to the uh, advantage of using the lightweight and the heavyweight. Uh, to my mind, each of this type of measures has its own uses. And regards to issues on porosity, the recommended porosity is 1 to 1.5 uh, nanometers 
with a burst strength of 60 newtons per meter squared. And there's a weak uh, evidence, however, that if you use a lightweight mesh, then it has something, it has, you may have some uh, uh, positive result regards to, with regards to post-operative pain. The mesh in the Liechtenstein is, of course, fixated. You can fix it by sutures. You may use absorbable or non-absorbable sutures. You may use a sutureless mesh, such as the self-gripping mesh. You may actually glue the mesh. And in some cases, tackers are used. Uh, you can see actually videos done by Parvis Amid before, wherein they tried to use tackers. But this has been abandoned already. And of course, for the fixation, whether you do open or laparoscopic, there is definitely an advantage if you use atraumatic mesh fixation. So let me share with you a video of uh, uh, an inguinal hernia repair. So this is now the subcutaneous tissue. By orientation, the X is your pubic tubercle, and this is the asis. So your superficial epigastric vessels has to be ligated not cauterized because this might cause some uh, subcutaneous hematoma later on. So this has to be ligated and uh, tied properly. In the videos of Parvis Amid, when you do Liechtenstein, he actually put some local anesthetics as well before the ligation. So once you get, goes through, go through the subcutaneous tissue, the next structure that you will see is the, the uh, uh, scarpus mus fascia which you now open, and then afterwards, you now see the external oblique. This is the in external ring, and this is the external oblique of aneurysis. So you may open it, and after opening it, just be careful not to injure the ilioinguinal nerve beneath, because sometimes it's readily exposed. So protect the nerve when you are opening the external oblique of aneurysis. Open the external oblique of aneurysis up, up to the external ring, and then subsequently identify the nerves. So that's the ilioinguinal, that's the iliohypogastric nerve. So that's the uh, ilioinguinal nerve. It usually lies on top of the cremaster muscle. So subsequently you open the lateral, that's the inguinal ligament side, and then dissect the spermatic cord away from the inguinal ligament using a blunt dissection. And you know, what you are looking for is actually the blue line because above that blue line is the genital nerve. So once you identify that, you can put your uh, cord holder. You can use a straight catheter, a foley cath, or a ring holder, and then mobilize the spermatic cord away from the pubic tubercle so that you would be able to achieve later on the two centimeter extension needed for the Liechtenstein technique. So this is what I call lateralizing the cord maneuver. So all of this adventitial tissue has to be dissected away from the pubic tubercle. So once you're satisfied, you now look for the deep epigastric vessel because that will give you an idea that you are at the level of the true internal ring. In this case, this is a, an incarcerated hernia. That's why we opted to open the sac. And that's the omentum, which was uh, incarcerated in the groin. So we reduced it from the scrotal area and then reduced all of it back into the intraperitoneal uh, area. So just be careful when you're doing this. If you are not handling this properly, you might cause inadvertent bleeding in the omentum and this might bleed inside. So the hernial sac is now dissect, dissected away from the spermatic uh, vessels and you have to identify the vas deferens and the spermatic vessels when you are doing the isolation of the hernial sac. So after the hernial sac is isolated, then we will transect the hernial sac and do high ligation. If the hernial sac is not a scrotal hernia, then you may opt to just dissect the hernial sac fully and avert the hernial sac into the intraperitoneal space or preperitoneal space rather. So that's the what we're doing, transecting the hernial sac because this is a scrotal hernia. That's the distal sac. This is the proximal sac. 
in cases where in your do the hernal sac uh, transection you have to make sure that the hemostasis of the sac is quite good otherwise this might bleed when you reduce it in the preperitoneal area so during the high ligation the hernal sac is doubly ligated by suture ligatures and before you transect the hernal sac you have to again recheck the hemostasis uh, of the sac because once you cut the hernal sac it will reduce uh, immediately to the preperitoneal space and if it bleeds you have will have difficulty in controlling it or even locating the hernal sac So you would notice as well that the spermatic cord, you don't denude the spermatic cord because you have to protect the vas deferens and the cord structures because if you leave it bare, it might come into contact with the mesh and there had been some reports of vas occlusion due to the contact of the vas to the mesh. So don't denude the cord, protect the cord, the vas with the cremaster muscle and uh, protect everything from the mesh that we're going to put on the floor. So I decided to use a self-gripping mesh uh, in this case for the simple reason that it will not, uh, I will not suture anymore and it will have the advantage of uh, uh, faster operation. The blue marker that you see initially has to be placed at the level of the pubic tubercle. So that's the blue, blue marker. That's a marker that you put at the level of the pubic tubercle, achieving the two centimeter uh, extension needed at the pubic tubercle area. So the secret in using this pro-grip uh, material is that you have to re retract the cord quite well, as well as the uh, tissues uh, not uh, involved in uh, fixing the mesh to the floor. So the key is retraction and uh, counter-traction. So the next, we will deploy the mesh at the inguinal ligament area. So you have to put some uh, uh, clamps at the external oblique aponeurosis to retract it again and use your retractors to retract this more laterally. And the key as well is that when you put the self-gripping mesh downward, make sure that there's no space at the inguinal ligament and the floor. So this mesh should hug the floor and the inguinal ligament. And subsequently, you now roll or unroll the mesh around the cord and this basically uh, mimics the cross tails that are supposed to be done in the classic Lichtenstein. So this particular sized mesh is a pre-sized mesh so you don't need to cut and these are usually uh, exact, uh, has an exact measurement for the patient. So for Filipinos, what we normally advise is you use the 12 by 8 uh, self-gripping mesh. And if you have a European or an American patient, because of their bigger habitus, we actually use a 14 by 9 uh, centimeter mesh. Now, when you are laying the mesh flat, make sure that there is no crumpling. So you see here, there's a bit of a fold. You have to unfold that because uh, crumpling and folding in the mesh will actually cause uh, chronic inguinal pain on the patient. So once that, that is done, uh, the uh, inventor of this mesh, uh, Professor Philip Chastan, actually recommends putting one stitch at the level of the pubic tubercle, like so, but this has already been debunked by, uh, by Professor Kingsworth because uh, it actually does not uh, um, prevent recurrences, but it can cause some chronic immunal pain if you do this. So I don't do this anymore. So once that is done, you recheck your hemostasis and uh, close the, uh, the fascia again. And that's it. So what about females? For females, the evidence would say that if expertise are available, you actually do laparoendoscopic repair for females for the simple reason that they have a higher chance of a femoral hernia. So it's best to investigate them at the preperitoneal area to see all the three holes of the MPO. And uh, if you have a femoral hernia, indeed, uh, this has to be a differential as to the diagnosis for groin hernia in females. 
Now, what about the round ligament? Traditionally, we cut the round ligament, but the current guidelines now state that for the open technique, you don't cut the round ligament, but for the laparoscopic technique, you may cut it or, pre or preserve it. But if you're going to cut it, you have to be cu cutting it proximal to the genital branch meeting at the fusion with the peritoneum because you might injure the genital branch. So again, some statements for females. Mesh is recommended for femoral hernia repair and laparoendoscopic procedure is recommended for femoral hernia repair. And of course, we all know that femoral hernias are easily strangulated. That's why a timely elective repair should be recommended as well. Now, what about young males? Uh, there was a statement by Professor Satyan yesterday that for young males, you may consider a sutured repair. However, you have to know that if you do a sutured repair, then the recurrences will be higher compared to the Liechtenstein. So if you're going to do Liechtenstein for a young male, you just have to advise them properly that there are prob possible problems or complications with the mesh and chronic immunal pain in the later years of life. What about antibiotic prophylaxis? So for antibiotic prophylaxis, it is recommended that if you have a high-risk patient or a high-risk environment, then you give antibiotic prophylaxis. However, if it's a low-risk patient, low risk environment, then you don't need to give antibiotics. For laparoendoscopic repair, antibiotic prophylaxis is not recommended. Now let's talk about some post-operative concerns. So immediate, let's do immediate, early, late, and the follow-up. So for convalescence, it's actually recommended that the patient can be up and about three to five days after their surgery, as long as they feel comfortable with it. Now, chronic inguinal pain is part and parcel of groin hernia repair. It has an incidence of about 10 to 12%. And we have to be aware that there is a scoring system for chronic inguinal pain and know how to manage them. So there are several scoring systems that you can use. You can use the Carolinas equation for quality of life. This is the form. You can use the URAHS uh, platform. And the best thing that you have to do for your patient is that this scoring system has to be done preoperatively and postoperatively. Why is that? Because you may have to identify patients who have chronic inguinal pain already prior to your surgery, and this might not be addressed by your groin hernia repair because the chronic inguinal pain might not be due to the inguinal hernia itself. Now, if you have the misfortune of having a chronic inguinal pain patient, and then the best way to diagnose them or to localize the source of the pain is to do dermatomal mapping as uh, uh, popularized by Professor Edward Felix. So this is the distribution. If you have involved the ilioinguinal nerve, there would be pain here. If the iliohypogastric nerve is involved, then you have pain, pain in this area. And if it's the genital nerve which you have uh, damaged, then the pain is here near the base of the scrotum. So prevention is the key because uh, uh, management of chronic immunal pain is actually difficult. And it has been proven that meshes has an advantage over tissue repair in trying to prevent immunal pain. Material reduced meshes also offer an advantage. Identifying the nerves is now mandatory. And prophylactic nerve resection does not actually help in preventing chronic immunal pain. So in the management, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to manage. You may have to observe the patient for three months and you do a role of the, do the dermatomal mapping to identify the exact source of the pain. But if your patient is complaining of uh, severe pain, then there might be a role to go back in uh, immediately after your surgery. You really have to identify, uh, uh, you really have to know the, uh, uh, indications in doing triple neurectomies, and you have to refer to experts in doing these procedures because you might cause more harm than good. For recurrences, these are the risk factors, female gender because of the possibility of a missed hernia for femoral, a low case volume center, limited surgical experience of the surgeon, poor surgical technique, which actually translates to poor dissection, and collagen abnormalities of the patient. So other causes of recurrence, inadequate dissection by the surgeon, inadequate overlap by the mesh, 
traditionally when I was still a resident, we cut the the uh, 7.5 by 15 mesh into half to to be shared by two patients, and we know better now that that is not uh, uh, right because you will uh, have uh, almost 100 percent recurrence when you do that. Defect closure, if the hernial ring or the hernial defect is quite big, you might have to do some form of defect closure or tightening of the ring to prevent recurrences. And we have to look at the mesh material itself. It hasn't been reported much for groin, but for ventral hernia, there has been reports, of course, of mesh failure, like central failures of the mesh. And lastly, for recurrences, the surgeon might not be experienced enough, and he, in fact, missed the hernia. So management of recurrent hernias, if there is an anterior tissue repair, you can still do an open anterior mesh repair or a laparoscopic repair. If there's an anterior mesh repair, there's no way to approach it but a posterior mesh repair. If you have a posterior mesh, then you have to approach it anteriorly. But of course, there have been reports of being approached again posteriorly by uh, expert laparoscopic surgeons. And if you have both anterior and posterior mesh repairs, such as in the bilayer repairs, then you have to probably refer now to a hernia specialist to do the repair for you. I think that's the last slide, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, for a very extensive lecture on Lichtenstein repair. Uh, with the indulgence of the faculty, uh, is it okay for us to, for, for you to uh, go on to the next lecture. We'll go to the lecture of uh, Professor Bailan Sutaja from Indonesia. Uh, his lecture will be about TAPP, Repair for Inguinal Hernia. And after that, we'll have the open forum on Liechtenstein and the TAPP uh, okay. to speak up for time. Uh, before the lecture of Professor Sutaja, uh, let's go to the poll. Uh, can we show the poll now? Okay, the first question is TAPP compared to TP is easier to learn. And the second question is TAPP is procedure of choice for complicated hernias. Uh, participants, please answer the poll. Thank you. Can we show the answer? For the first question, TPP compared to TEP is easier to learn. 100% of the participants answered yes. Uh, for the second question, TPP is the procedure of choice for complicated hernias. 64% answered yes and 36% uh, answered no. Uh, so with this, let's go to the lecture of Professor Bailan Sutaja from Jakarta, yeah. Indonesia. Uh, Professor Byron Suteja is also the one of the past presidents of the Asia Pacific Hernia Society. Uh, let's go to Professor Suteja. Marlian, please. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moment. Is that yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you, Alan, for your uh, nice in introduction. So I'm from Jakarta. Badian uh, Suteja is my name. And I have the duty to tell you about the TAPP repair for inguinal hernia. And yesterday, we have heard from Professor Tsubai about the TEP. And now we try to compete with him yeah, with the, our TAPP. Next. So, as you know, TAPP repair, laparoscopic hernia repair for adult, can be used in almost all, all type of adult inguinal hernia, depending on level of the expertise of the surgeon. And some of the advantages of the TAPP uh, repair. is uh, diagnostic uh, laparoscopy in some uh, uh, special case, for example, incarcerated hernia, femoral hernia, or sliding hernia is uh, suitable 
to use the TAPP repair. And also the, the advantages of the TAPP is to assess the contralateral groin area so that you can see if the patient have a both side of hernia or not. And this is a, some uh, example for Alian, the slides are not moving. Are not moving? Are not moving now? No, no. We still see the first slide. First slide? Okay. This slide is not moving. This slide is not Put it on slideshow. On slideshow, yes. Yeah. We have. This is on, on slideshow now. Just a moment. I Show a lower part, right lower part of your PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. Mana itu slideshow? Moment. Can you see now? We see the video now. You see the video now? Yeah. Okay, okay. I try to pick the. Okay. You see now? So, uh, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. And you can see the video? We can yes. see the video now. Is that clear? Okay, the, one of the advantages for the TAPP is to do the diagnostic. If you have the incarcerated hernia, you can see if the hernia is already uh, back to the abdomen, uh, abdominal uh, cavity or not, that is the first one. And if not, you can do also the reposition uh, during the TAPP. And you have time uh, to wait uh, uh, to see uh, if the bowel intact or not. That is uh, the advantage of the TAPP because uh, we have time to uh, can decide if the resection uh, must be done or not. Uh, slide. So, and we can see also from the one side to other side is the diagnostic for, for which we can see from uh, the right side and left side, and that is the big advantage of the TAPP. In TEP, you cannot see the other side from the side of the hernia. So, and if you see the TAPP, uh, pre-op preparation is quite uh, the same, like uh, from Professor Tsubai yesterday, you must empty your bladder and uh, you must have the uh, intravenous uh, fluid, but restrictive volume, so that you can uh, be safe that the patient can uh, uh, have not the uh, retention of urine after the operation. If you have the difficulty or you expected the difficulty, you must uh, take the uh, uh, catheter for, for uh, this kind of operation, or if the patient have prostate operation and so on, you must uh, prepare for the longer operation, then you must uh, have the catheter for it.
So, and patient position is the same uh, like the TEP uh, and should be secure with strap and also adequate support for shoulder because we do in Trendelenburg uh, uh, position and sometimes you must move to left or to right side. And the initial access you can do in open technique or we have done mostly in, uh, with uh, the uh, ferris needle in a closed technique because it is not uh, too, uh, uh, it's as faster than if you do the open technique. And should be a deep uh, to the local situation. That means if the patient obeys or prefers intra-abdominal surgery, there must be decided for the other way to do the peri peritoneum. So, and the trocar type, the trocar type use the normal trocar type for the, uh, for the TAPP is not unusual. With normal, you can use with reusable one or you can use also uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, normal trocar, but uh, very important is not use the cut trocar. So, so that you can not have the, uh, the hernia in the incisional hernia after the TAPP because this is one of the problem of TAPP compared to the TEP. And for the uh, position of the surgeon or, or the uh, patient and the surgeon, this is the normal position, but we in my clinic, we have done like this, the surgeon is on the left side of the uh, right side of the camera uh, uh, assistant, because I think is the easier for the cameraman because we don't have the fixed cameraman always change. They, uh, uh, they can do the camera uh, operationing easier when they see from the uh, same side like the surgeon see. Yeah, and this is the trocar position. We have, uh, this is supra umbilical, 10 millimeter and the para umbilical, uh, five centimeter. Depend on uh, the, the diagnosis at the first time. If you have only one side of the hernia, you can uh, uh, place the trocar on the side of the hernia higher and from the other side as uh, the uh, 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 further to the uh, uh, not in, in the in the same level yeah so that uh, you can not have the struggling intra abdominal during the operation so if we see, this is a, we started always with the peritoneal incision. We marked sometime uh, the position where we cut the peritoneum with uh, the normal culture. You can mark this so that you can uh, make the incision uh, like this three until four centimeter from uh, above all the possible of the areas. Sometimes you have both hernia, so that we must certain that the, the incision uh, high enough so that the covering of the mass uh, good enough is for all the hernia. So, and uh, what is uh, the better uh, uh, for the uh, TAPP repair is better visualization of the anatomy structure. During creation of the preperitoneal space, you see all the things uh, uh, of the preperitoneal space, the nerve, the, the vessel, and so on, very clearly so that you can avoid the trauma of this uh, organ. And for the dissection, we start the dissection 
normally, if we see the attention uh, from bowel or omentum to the hernia, uh, you don't uh, take it down because if you uh, cut it, sometimes you make some hole in the peritoneum. Uh, so uh, you must uh, suture it later on by closing the peritoneum. peritoneum. So that this is the, uh, not necessary to take it down the addition uh, to the hernia set. So the, uh, <clears throat> the complete anatomical dissection of the whole pelvic floor is necessary for flat and wrinkle free placement of the mass. This is very important because uh, if you don't complete the, uh, make complete dissection, you can miss uh, some hernia, it's the first thing. And the second thing also, you cannot place the mass, uh, the big mass inside and also flat without wrinkling. The minimal mass site is as uh, yesterday we discussed already, minimally a uh, minimal 10 by 15 uh, centimeter. In the bigger uh, uh, side of hernia, you must, you can use more than this side of uh, mass. So that we must prepare it very order, very clear. And also uh, the, the, <clears throat> the preperitoneal uh, space must be big enough to, uh, to accommodate all the uh, side of the mass. Sorry, balik gimana? So this is uh, as a example. Uh, we must uh, make the peritoneal dissection like this. This is thin enough that uh, there's only peritoneum where we prepare and we cut all the uh, pre-peritoneal uh, uh, tissue mostly is without a uh, vessel. So that this is clean, no blood and you prepare as far as possible to the medial first to see the public bone and to uh, one or two centimeter uh, to uh, the, the uh, right or left side of the uh, uh, body. And <clears throat> so, the extent of the section is very important, like uh, I said before, one centimeter beyond the symphysis, pubis, and to the contralateral side, and also the, uh, to cranially three to four centimeter above the uh, transversal arch or any direct defects, laterally to assess. And caudally minimal four centimeter below the iliopubic tract and the level of psoas muscle and two or three centimeter below the pupal ligament at the level of superior as of the pubic bone. This is very important so that we cannot miss the other hernia and also we can accommodate the uh, big side of the uh, mass. This is sometimes important uh, to have the bigger mass than the usual 10 by 15. And the objective of the <clears throat> is to retract all the peritoneal sac, the corresponding pre and extra peritoneal retroperitoneal fat tissue from the hernia orificial down. And we call it as peritonealization, yeah, parietalization, so that this is all clear to, to see what uh, in front of uh, the tissue, you can see all the uh, hernia in the uh, a perfect floor. And uh, this is, we can see also here. Uh, we must dissect all the mm, uh, set. This is the direct hernia, you see. We can uh, 
uh, take down the pseudo sex. Yeah, As you see clearly with all the fat tissue. So that this is in the hole. This is uh, inside the pseudo sex. Uh, is nothing left. Oh. <clears throat> for the, also for the indirect hernia lipom in the spermatic part and in the ligament, uh, round ligament, you must take it down. And also lipom in the direct and uh, femoral hernia should be also removed. And if uh, the dense assist as uh, attention to the cord structure are present in the long hernia sac, the sac may be Practitionally transected. So, in the direct hernia, the incidence of seroma is in the direct hernia can be significantly reduced when the uh, legs transversalis fascia, or we call it pseudosac, inverted and fixed to the uh, pupal ligament. And although the seroma is uh, common early postoperative as a minor uh, complication in endoscopic prep uh, peritonea hernia repair. It's like this, we can see, this is a <clears throat> direct hernia with a relative uh, big hole, uh, as we already uh, take it down the, in the, the contain of the hernia, we take the pseudo sac and fix it with the uh, cuba ligament. It can uh, make uh, the uh, survey uh, flat to uh, uh, accommodate the uh, mass and also uh, we can uh, reduce the possibility to have the seroma. So, and for the mass issue, the mass is a uh, manual 10 to, uh, by 15 centimeter is recommended, but in the bigger uh, hernia, you must use bigger mass. Yeah? This is, uh, for example, the L3 or M3, you must uh, now, uh, you to, uh, must have the bigger mass. So, so parietalization, we can move. Uh, so it means we must make the sp uh, space so big that we can accommodate the mass easy uh, to come to the uh, preperitoneal space like this. Okay. And in the bigger mass or in the bigger hole of the hernia, uh, you must uh, sometimes make the fixation. Yeah? Although in the hernia guideline, we need only in a very a big uh, indirect hernia and also in M3 hernia, the fixation in TAPP. And if you do the uh, fixation, you can do fixation with TECA like this, yeah? but uh, we must a uh, very, uh, the important thing is that TECA is all above the iliopubic tracts. Yeah. You can fix on both sides of the, of the mass and also in the uh, cupa ligament here. Okay. And also you can fix it with the glue. Yeah. You can uh, take the glue that is with uh, histoacryl or fibrin glue, yeah, you can fix this, is uh, uh, adequate for the fixation, yeah, for the fixation. So, and last but not least is the port uh, side closer. As we said before, this is one uh, thing in the TAPP is the possibility to have the uh, hernia postoperatively, incisional hernia. So there are the fascia defect more than one centimeter, you or one centimeter or more, you should uh, do the closer. Yeah. 
So, what is the uh, post-operative ambulation physical activity is not restricted after the operation. It depends on the pain on the patient uh, uh, habits and the early normal activity can be safely be recommended. This is no uh, strict that this three or four week uh, you must have the uh, uh, not uh, the the movement without pain. You can do all the things. So, uh, that is I uh, resume all the we talked before. This is <clears throat> what uh, how I do it for the normal hernia with TAPP. This is the irreducible uh, hernia with uh, con uh, momentum content. This is uh, normally if you have the relaxation due to the uh, general anesthesia, uh, mostly you can reduce the content easy. And you first you do the peritoneal incision and you make some holes here in the peritoneum and we can let the CO2 uh, go inside to the peritoneal, pre-peritoneal space so that we can cut the peritoneum easier. And very important is we must stay in the, uh, 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 the, the plane without the vessel. And if you reach the place of the epigastric hernia, this is the place of dangers. Yeah? And you must take care of it. Uh, the first, you must make the uh, dissection in the medial side uh, so that we can uh, go uh, to the contralateral side, one or two centimeters. You see the pubic bone there, yeah, here. And this is uh, big enough. And, and to the life side, and after then, you uh, take care of the uh, sick. You must remove all the fat and uh, so that this is nothing left behind. And you do the parietalization and so that we can accommodate all the uh, either the, uh, and the mass uh, easier and flat. Is the uh, fatty tissue? Uh, we don't remove it, but we take out uh, from the uh, preperitoneal space to the intraabdominal space. So that, <clears throat> and this is uh, to prevent the seroma. We do the fixation of the pseudo sac to the copper ligament, and. And we can try to, to see if the place enough is, and we take the uh, 15 by 10 centimeter. In our country, is mostly enough with this uh, side of the mess. You can fix it, or you can, uh, in the TEP, I think is a no fixation. Uh, 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 necessary, but in TAPP, we do almost always a uh, fixation, mostly with uh, uh, glue. Uh, for example, we do with the self made uh, uh, application for the glue with the uh, uh, gastric tube, a small gastric tube, but the difficulty of this is actually. Uh, the, uh, the technique is not so very easy because it blocks very, very fast if you uh, 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 touch the, the mass or if you have the, uh, the liquid inside uh, on, the, on the mass. Yeah. After then, you close uh, the peritoneum like this. And so this is the end of the operation. And for take message, this is the adventure of the TAPP is the uh, 
concomitant exploratory, exploratory laparoscopy so that you can see uh, all the pathology inside the abdominal cavity. And TAPP is indicated in incarcerated or sliding hernia if you have uh, the expertise for this. Yeah. And the key is to dissect a large preperitoneal space uh, that will accommodate the mass of site minimal 15 by 10 is, uh, uh, without full. And also the preperitoneal closures should be uh, meticulous and uh, complete so that is uh, not to the uh, internal hernia, come to internal hernia. So that is all I have to uh, say today and thank you very much for your attention. So, okay. So Ellen, thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Barian. Yeah. Dr. Allen is on the other side. Um, we open the floor to questions. Okay, Marky, there, there is a question for you I can see. Yeah. Can I read out the question to you? Yep, sure. It says fantastic. This is from 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 Dr. Manuel Raymon Domingo. Fantastic presentation and demonstration of the self gripping mesh, sir. Do Dr. Shastan, in the early days, recommend a retro funicular closure, the, which is pomatic cord above the fascia, uh, to lessen chronic inguinal pain. So, uh, do you still do this? No, no. Uh, I never adopted the technique of uh, Philip uh, putting this permatic cord above the external oblique. I'm a believer of uh, doing the technique classically. Uh, if uh, the Liechtenstein group actually uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, the cord has to be placed beneath the external oblique, then you do so the classical way of doing it, because that's the only way that you can uh, replicate the results of the technique. You have to do it the same way that the Liechtenstein Institute is doing it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maki. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yeah, I can see one more popping up. Uh, this is uh, from Dr. Alan Anthony Sesse. In the absence of a fixation device, can we just fix the mesh by suturing it manually? Uh, TPP, do you mean? Yes, perhaps you could uh, uh, take this barlen. Yes, for TPP, actually you can do the fixation also with suturing. But yeah, also with suturing, you can do it in the upper ligament area and also on the side and the upper edge of the mesh, you can do the suturing. This is uh, quite adequate, but it takes time a little bit. Okay, so, so well, perfectly acceptable to, to suture if you don't have a fixation device. That yes. is the, uh, the message. Uh, okay, Dr. Arman Posadas says, thank you, Prof, for a very nice lecture. For, for athletic individuals, when do you recommend going to gym after lap hernia? Yeah, you for want lap hernia? Yes. For, for the APP, I think it's, uh, uh, it depends on the patient. If they don't have a problem, I would like to uh, to advise them uh, one or two weeks not to go to gym, but the usual uh, uh, daily activity they can do, but not at the gym. This is my opinion, my personal opinion, without any uh, evidence of this. 
Okay, Satyan, do you, do you want to say anything about uh, what, what do you, you know, advise your patients after a lap repair? How, how long, uh, you know, and what is your advice? Yeah, the, like Dr. Balian said, regular activities, you can do it immediately. But for um, strenuous activity like gym, I think you should get about two weeks. The, the reason for two weeks is that uh, it, it just like uh, on the surface, the incision, after a week, then it would be strong enough to, uh, for things that it won't be moved. If before one week, sometimes things still can be loosened. And another thing is uh, you get secondary hematoma. For, I think for athletic activity, it's said to be two weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so can we well move on? Rolf, uh, can we move on, Maki? Yeah. Uh, right. What's next? Okay, so, well, next is going to be decision making in inguinal hernia surgery. So, this is going to be about uh, about some questions that we all face as surgeons uh, when when we sort of do our daily work, particularly in the operation theater. So, so what this is about decision making about problem solving, and uh, uh, we would like this particular session to to be. Uh, uh, as interactive as possible. So let's see how, how we get along. So I'm gonna share my screen first of all. And I'm gonna find my, my decision making. And I'm gonna go right on top. And I'm gonna make this slide show. So can you see my slide, Maki? Yeah. Right, okay. So, it's a fairly common situation that we all face as surgeons. And what I want to, to, to ask our participants is that when you have a patient that has these two conditions together, Okay, gold stones with an inguinal hernia. And what I want to also tell you is that this patient has an empyema of the gallbladder. But he's got two problems. So he tells you, Doc, you, you will go in with your laparoscope in any case. So why not fix both my problems at the same time? Okay. So that is the, the situation that we are faced with. Now, what do we do? So we have these three options. Okay, as surgeons, we, we, we can either operate both together, which means the, the gallstones along with the hernia, or do one at a time, or we operate both together but then selectively. So we've got this poll open for all our participants. Please stick on just one. Well, what do you think is the right way forward in this scenario? You have 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Since I can't see you, obviously, uh, we'll need to work you know, through your feedback on the poll. Okay, so what have we got? Oh, look at that. So 52% of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the brethren that we have, you know, with us at this time, 52% say do one at a time. 36% say you can do both, but selectively. And I think, uh, you know, I'm quite pleased actually with this response, to be honest. 
Uh, see, the thing about doing two surgeries at the same time, when, when one of the surgeries is a hernia, is that uh, with a hernia repair, you need a prosthetic mesh, which is like an implant in the body. So the setting of surgery has to be clean surgery. Okay, that is when you get best results. You are going to put in an implant in the body. So you need the, the setting of clean surgery, not the setting of clean contaminated surgery. So what we believe is that you must uh, speak to your patient beforehand, counsel them, you know, that you can do both together only if there is no contamination during surgery. So perhaps do the gallbladder first. If it's a straightforward gallbladder, there's no pus in the gallbladder, there are no spilled stones, there is no spilled bile, perhaps you can do, you can do both together you know, for that particular patient. But as far as possible, try and do one surgery at a time. Now, you have another patient scenario. This, this time you've got a 65 year old gentleman walking into you and, and asking you the same thing. He says, doc, I've got a prostate problem. You know, I've got significant urinary symptoms. And just for your information, this patient had a significant urinary infection, you know, one week prior. So now he comes to you. He says, can I have both these operations at the same sitting? So what do we do? So again, these are the options. We can, we can do both together. My goodness, this, this is something else. Cherry, we've got a different slide over here. So we can either, uh, uh, well, do both surgeries together at the same sitting. Thank you. Or we do one at a time or again, operate both together, but very selectively. So can we have polling on this one as well, please? What is going to be your choice? Okay, can we have the answers, please? Yeah, one at a time. Again, 58% say one at a time and 27% say, say selectively. But there is a brave band of surgeons also that constitutes about 15% that say that, that you can do both together. Now, the problem with, uh, with this sort of an approach, actually with this combination is the fact that there are chances of significant contamination of the surgical field because it's the, the same area, more or less, the, the pre-peritoneal region, uh, which is the, the sort of site of action here. So, so uh, with a prostatectomy, and now I told you also that, that this patient had significant urinary tract infection a, a week ago. So that there are chances of contamination of the surgical field when you do both surgeries together. With a TUR prostate, uh, there, there is going to be extra vasation of the irrigation fluid in the preperitoneal region, which is the space that, that you want to use for repair of the inguinal hernia. So this sort of a combination doesn't normally gel. You know, you, you are in fact uh, 
uh, not sticking to the principles of trying to have a clean surgical field when you are doing a hernia repair. So in this sort of a scenario, one at a time seems to be the best way forward. Now the message here from, from these sort of double pathology patients is that hernia repair involves use of a prosthetic mesh. So the hernia repair setting should be one of clean surgery. Okay, that is the, the, the message that, that goes across to you from uh, this particular set of patients. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Now, we heard Maki some, some time ago. Uh, we, we, we heard Professor Maki Falona. We heard uh, uh, Bardlin. And uh, they talked about uh, 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 the inguinal hernia repair in females. And this is just to, to, in fact, put before you the fact that for females, there is a strong case for suggesting endolaparoscopic repair, which means either a TEP or a TAPP, okay? And why that is so also, uh, Maki explained to us, but uh, th this is one side of the groin, okay? Female inguinal hernia repair. So this was, the symptomatic side. This was the, the side where we, we could in fact find the hernia clinically. So that is the, the left side being operated as you can see at the moment. Uh, the in, inferior epigastric vessels, deep inguinal ring, uh, lipoma, <laughs> and uh, the round ligament here. Okay, but then lo and behold, on the other side, there, there is a, uh, there is this hernia on the right side. So this is an occult hernia. This is a hernia that was not recognized clinically. And this is the, the femoral <coughs> ring. Cooper's ligament, <coughs> lacunar ligament, the pectineal ligament on top. So that, that was a femoral hernia. Okay, so this, this patient had and occult femoral hernia on the other side. So, oh. So uh, with females, the message here is that we know there, that there is a greater incidence of femoral hernias in females. And so females with groin hernias are recommended to undergo endolaparoscopic repair with a preperitoneal mesh. And why an endolaparoscopic repair? Because with an endolaparoscopic repair, you can see the entire myopectineal orifice of Fruchon, not just the, the, the site of the direct, the site of the indirect hernia, but you can also look at femoral hernias. And like we, we saw yesterday, you, you can also diagnose pelvic hernias, the obturator hernias, which are the, the, the silent hernias, which are uh, not in fact readily diagnosed. But then with the endolaparoscopic approach, you can look at the, the, the entire myopectineal orifice. You can look down on the pelvis 
And that is why, particularly for females, it makes more sense to do an endolaparoscopic approach. Uh, uh, well, Maki, please uh, feel free to uh, let me know if I'm going too quickly or if something needs clarification. Because with this session, normally I can see everybody face to face and then I'm happy. But yeah. here I, we, are, we are all staring at uh, screens in front. That is, that is the, the well, COVID era for you. So I can't get any feedback. So, so please feel free to, 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 to interrupt and, and to let me know if I'm going too soon or if something needs clarification. Okay, so this time we've got a 45 year old gentleman now, this chappy has had some previous laparotomy 10 years ago for a, for a vehicular accident. Okay, he has had some sort of a bowel resection, he says, during laparotomy, but he has no details. He has now developed a groin hernia and he says, Doc, do, do whatever surgery is the best for me. So you decide. I would, would in fact prefer laparoscopic surgery, but then you're the boss. You, you would decide whatever is best for me. So previous laparotomy, previous pelvic surgery, what are the options for, for an inguinal hernia repair? Uh, you know, what would you do in this sort of a scenario? So we have three options here, obviously. We can either do a TEP or do a DAPP or then do an open repair. So please poll here. Let us know what you would rather do. Okay, can we have some uh, results, please? Right, now, now, look at that. So 40% say that uh, TEP would, would be the best option. 20% say TAPP would be a good option. And 40% uh, would, would rather uh, go in open. So, so well, uh, Barlin is not going to be very happy to look at this poll because Barlin just just told us a while ago that uh, that for the difficult hernias, do a TAPP. So. Yeah, the message is that when there is pelvic, when when there has been some pelvic pathology or scarring or or previous pelvic surgery or previous pelvic radiation, or for those patients uh, on peritoneal dialysis, consider an anterior approach. So when there is problem in the posterior segment with the posterior approach. And this, this patient had previous surgery, which means he has you know, adhesions from his previous surgery. We don't know, you know what, what, uh, what, sort of, what sort of a surgical picture we are finally going to be presented with. And so, uh, you know, a TEP in this sort of a scenario would be a fairly difficult option because uh, that space has been violated earlier from prior surgery. So what our guidelines tell us is that uh, the safest approach for this sort of a patient is to, to, to uh, perform an anterior approach, which means do an open repair. And why do an open repair? Because that is now a virgin plane. 
No, you, you have not done uh, previous surgery from there. And so that may be uh, the safest thing to do under the circumstances. Uh, uh, what I would in fact request, uh, the, you know, Rolf and Satyan, Barlen, if he's there, Maki, uh, please, uh, you know, feel free to all come in and, uh, and say something that uh, may, may in fact clarify or if you want to, you know, uh, put in something there because we don't have feedback from the audience like we normally do. I can't even see them. So if, if you want to, you know, just uh, uh, jut in and say something or clarify, please do. Please feel free, okay? Yeah, yeah. Sure. I can I've start okay. with this, um, um, Anil. Um, definitely, um, according to the guidelines and according to the most safest proce procedure for the patient, the anterior approach will be adequate. Specifically, if you consider Liechtenstein uh, procedure, you will not touch any of the previous um, scars or of the previous surgery site unless there was a funnel incision in females, for example. But if it is about prostate surgery, it will be a male. Normally, the, um, the urologist will not go um, uh, via funnel incision. So um, the anterior approach is definitely fine. However, um, it depends on the um, previous surgery, what kind of surgery it was, what kind of pelvic surgery. It depends on the surgeon, um, how much of adhesion he had, whether this was an open pelvic surgery or a laparoscopic surgery. It also depends on the skills of the uh, laparoscopic surgeon to go in again. We all know that TAPP has been performed after prosthetic surgery, successfully performed after prosthetic surgery without any major uh, problems during the surgery. But it is definitely something for the super expert. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Rolf. So to, to uh, take things further, you know, uh, well, in the same vein, now we've got a patient that has come to you with a recurrent inguinal hernia following previous open surgery. Okay, so, so he had uh, perhaps a bassini repair earlier. Now he's got a recurrence. Now he's come to you for surgery. Okay, he, he tells you, doc, do whatever the best that you can for me. So now what are the surgical options we have for this patient that has a recurrent inguinal hernia following a previous bassini repair? So the polling question here is again, the surgery of choice in this situation would be an open surgery, would be a TEP, or would be a TAPP. Okay, can we have results, please? Right. <laughs> Barlen. Interesting. <laughs> They are all on your side. Seventy-five <laughs> percent. All my friend, uh, Anil. Uh, yes. they're, they're... <laughs> yeah. You you seem to have made a, a very significant impact. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you very much for the participants. People say that they would do a TAPP, seventeen percent a TEP, and and of course eight percent an open. Now, again, in, in this sort of a scenario, you know, there, there's not much to, to uh, choose between a TAPP and a TEP because it is a straightforward recurrence, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so uh, between a TAPP and a TEP is your choice, but not an open because we have done an open repair before and we would not like to, to, to use 
the same approach that was used the first time. So, okay, now similarly for a recurrent inguinal hernia, for a patient that had a previous TEP repair. So now you, ha you have a patient with a recurrent inguinal hernia that has had a previous TEP repair. So he's got a recurrence and he tells you, Doc, do whatever is the best for me. So can we have the polling again, please? So, so a recurrent inguinal hernia following previous TEP repair, these are the options. And open repair, a TEP repair again, or a TAPP repair. Okay, can we have the results, please? Ah, look at that. Yeah, They've learned it. So yes, it it makes sense to to uh, do an anterior repair now, following a previously failed posterior repair, and that is exactly what our guidelines state. Okay, this this is the message for you for recurrent inguinal hernias. So basically, use the opposite approach for repair the second time. So uh, following previously failed anterior repair, do a posterior repair. And following previously failed posterior repair, do an anterior repair. Okay, fairly straightforward. Do, do you want to add anything? Anybody wants to add anything here? This is for Satin. Yeah, this, this, this is pretty straightforward. Okay, now you've got these buggers that sometimes come and give trouble. <laughs> so, yeah, just like this. Okay, left-sided inguinal hernia. And look at that blob. So there is more and more of it that is going inside the deep ring, as you can see. The, the deep ring, inferior epigastric vessels, and, and this is the cord lipoma. So, uh, do, do you want to say something about cord lipoma as a, uh, well, well uh, Maki, do, do, you, do you want to comment on cord lipomas and their significance? Yeah, uh, for cord lipomas, once you see it, whether anteriorly or laparoscopically or endoscopically, uh, two things. One, you have to identify that it's really a cord lipoma and not just a fatty cord. Uh, the difference is that cord lipoma is easily dissected out. A fatty cord you will bleed if you dissect it out from the cord. Now, cord lipomas, you have to reduce. Uh, uh, everything should be reduced into the preperitoneal space because uh, if you leave a cord lipoma behind, that might mimic another inguinal hernia and the patient will feel a bulge. So you have to remove that cord lipoma. Okay, Rolf, anything to add? Yeah, I can tell a story to my, to my shame. I have left the cord lipoma half on the cord because it, I, I had the impression I had reduced it entirely and resected, which was really big. And after the surgery, the patient still had a pseudo hernia. And when I went in from a scrotal incision, he had another huge cord lipoma there, which had to be resected and 
was confirmed by histopathology. So there was no recurrent hernia. It was just that huge that it can be very difficult to make sure from a endoscopic view that you got it all. That uh, is my lesson I learned from this case. So sometimes you feel you have reduced it entirely, but it's not the case. So you, you should basically check from outside whether you really got it all. They can be huge. Right. So, so the message here is to excise cord lipomas. You know, very straightforward message here. Yeah, but Anil, sometimes it's very difficult to, to excite it because as, uh, you, you must, as uh, uh, Maki said, distinguish between the fatty tissue there or the uh, lipoma actually. Yeah? If you don't, uh, uh, you cannot distinguish about these two things that come to bleeding. This is, it happened to me several times as we think that is a lipoma and you remove and you try to remove, remove and end up with a, a little bit bleeding. This is uh, my opinion, you must be take care of it. Yeah, I completely agree, Barlen. Uh, uh, and a word of caution here as well, because uh, uh, we have noticed that in several patients, uh, uh, cord lipomas, you know, uh, uh, need to be distinguished very carefully from fat that sits on top of the external iliac vessels. So in a fatty patient, uh, you know, with, with, with a lot of fat in that region, you must clearly distinguish between a cord lipoma and fat that sits on top of the external iliac vessels. Because if you, if you go about dissecting that fat on top of the iliac vessels, there, there is going to be more and more bleeding. And as far as cord lipomas goes, the, the, main, the, the, the main criterion is to, to look where the fat is going. It has to be going inside the deep ring. That is a cord lipoma. And cord lipomas also are of two types, actually. The first type is the friendly type, which is uh, completely separate from the vein. The second type is uh, the type where, where there is a lot of fat around the testicular veins. And bringing these lipomas down is much more, more difficult. You, you have got to sacrifice the vein at times. So uh, that, sort of, that sort of a decision has to be taken uh, with those cord lipomas. Right. Yes. Uh, Maki, Thank you. Hmm? Maki? Maki, please. Tell me when it is 35 minutes and then I'll stop and, and then we'll, we'll sort of move on. Now, a 12-year-old male with a bilateral lingual hernia. Okay, you are presented with this problem in your clinic. And, uh, uh, you know, what they want to know from, from you is what to do in this sort of a situation. So, so this is that patient. Okay, 12 year old, fairly big hernias. Yeah. Now, the whole point of the story is just to, to uh, let you know that in, in uh, children and uh, some adolescents too, we would rather not use a mesh for hernia repair. So th this perhaps is all that is required, uh, herniotomy. And here you, you have to be careful. You have to first pinch up the peritoneum and then take uh, the suture with the needle because uh, you know there are some vital structures in the vicinity like the vas deferens, the, the testicular vessels, and you don't want that coming into your suture. So, so just a herniotomy in this, uh, you know, in these uh, uh, world group of patients. So the message is pretty clear, avoid mesh in children and, and adolescents. Okay, fairly straightforward. 
so now we have got a situation wherein we we have incarcerated inguinal hernia containing omentum in a patient okay you can can feel it on clinical examination and you have taken this patient to to the operating theater put him to sleep you know under general anesthesia you have tried to to in fact reduce the hernia and the general anesthesia but you can't do it so now what so just to to in fact give you the the well clinical scenario yeah so you you tried hard you you could not bring the the momentum down so what we had done in that sort of a situation was was to in fact divide the momentum at the level of the deep ring there and then since we are fond of tp repairs we we did that and then came back and did a tep repair for the patient ligation of the sac division of the distal sac and then finally you know did what dr chobe called yesterday as the hybrid approach which means did the hernia repair and then brought out the incarcerated omentum from a separate incision on the scrotum this is the the uh, the closed uh, skin incisions from the hernia repair now just want to take one more scenario along with this you may have a similar situation of incarceration but then this time there uh, there is bowel that has been incarcerated in the hernial sac so now this is just a view to show you the tep approach with an incarcerated segment of bowel lying within the hernia now that that there is the bowel that has been incarcerated and you can see there is a struggle the view is not great you've got a limited view there's a struggle to get your your uh, things in place and then more importantly you can't see what segment of the bowel you have reduced back to the peritoneal cavity and now compare that with tapp approach for incarcerated hernias containing bowel now here you find you have a much better view you are you are more in control you are in fact comfortable working so so this is what in fact barlen was, was trying to tell us that for uh, for these sort of hernias for, for the incarcerated hernias a tapp may be a, a, a a much better approach because of the diagnostic laparoscopy that that precludes a, a tapp approach uh, uh do we have more time maki are we running behind time uh i think we have to go on anil but before uh, before going doing that i actually have a question in the chat box uh okay what if you have a recurrent hernia post lichtenstein but the patient will not be able to tolerate general anesthesia how will you approach this patient would you still do yeah, that, endoscopic or endoscopic well that one is for you, for you maki obviously for for me if the patient is not fit for a general anesthesia i, I personally would not think of of an endolaparoscopic repair you know because uh, uh, you 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 try doing 
you know, a TEP or a TAPP under uh, some sort of an alternative anesthesia, like a spinal or an epidural. And if there is a struggle, uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a very difficult situation to be in. So there is less of control when you try doing this sort of a patient with a posterior approach, since the patient is not fit for general anesthesia. So, so maybe send to an expert that will try again the anterior approach. Yeah. What that, do you have to say? What do you have to say? Uh, Mati, maybe, yeah. maybe. Hello? We lost you, Barian. Proper procedure, I think, may be the option for this because it uh, can be done in spinal anesthesia and you go in like the, um, like the laparoscopy, TAPP, but uh, in the, in the mean of open surgery, stopa procedure. Yeah, the, the, the reason why I asked the question is that uh, one of my uh, mentors uh, who is, uh, I think, watching uh, our live feed also mentioned that uh, for a recurrent mesh uh, hernia, the other possible approach is an open preperitoneal uh, mesh repair. So yeah. like in cases, as mentioned by Barlian, if the patient cannot tolerate general anesthesia, then certainly an open preperitoneal uh, repair can be done. There is a question in the Q&A uh, from uh, Dr. Santo Domingo. What is the recommended management for pregnant patients with bulging groin hernia diagnosed in their first or second or third trimester of pregnancy? Can the hernia repair be done concomitantly with the cesarean section? Anybody in the panelists? Okay, some, somebody wants to take that or should I speak? Yeah, well, by and large for, for this sort of a situation, you must wait till things settle down, I think. There's, yeah. no point, uh, there's no point, I think, rushing into surgery because once uh, she has gone through her pregnancy, once uh, you know, she, she has delivered her baby and she is more comfortable, it makes sense to, to uh, do a planned hernia repair un okay, under controlled conditions. There's no point uh, uh, trying to uh, rush you know, into a hernia repair because we know the best results from a hernia repair would come when you have things like, uh, under proper control, which, which, which means uh, a planned surgery. So as, far as far, so, so as far as possible, according to me, defer the surgery, wait for controlled conditions, and then do a planned hernia repair. Anil, we should, I think, go on with your lecture right. on the anatomy. Okay. All right. Then let's move on from here. Let us end the show. And uh, now, now move on to, to the anatomy, right? Yes. Anatomy okay. of the so, abdominal wall. Okay. Thanks, Maki. Now, just to, to uh, let our friends know that we have moved on from uh, the inguinal region onto uh, the anterior abdominal wall, okay, the, the, the ventral incisional hernias. And this uh, uh, talk is the first, okay, in that series of uh, ventral incisional abdominal wall hernia repairs. So I want to start off uh, with the anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall and uh, this is not going to be a class on anatomy because we sort of more or less are familiar with the broad contours of the anterior abdominal wall. So, so with the anterior abdominal wall, there, there is a medial compartment and a lateral compartment. Okay, the medial compartment consists of a paired muscle, the rectus abdominis muscle, and the lateral compartment comprises three flat muscles of the abdominal wall. Uh, 
Uh, the medial compartment comprises of uh, the, the rectus abdominis muscle that is placed within a sheath in front and at back, the anterior and the posterior rectus sheaths. The, the junction of the medial compartment and the lateral compartment comprises a, a zone that is that, in fact, uh, it is called the, the linea semilunaris, but it, it should be looked upon as a, as a band, as a zone rather than a line. Uh, th this is quite important, particularly with, with newer concepts of uh, the, the abdominal wall hernia repair that have, uh, that have started to gain some ground. So this can, can be, in fact, uh, uh, come to be known with uh, the ultrasound as well. So, so, so well, with, with the 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 patient lying down you, you can actually map uh, the region of the the linear semilunaris you know, on both sides and that that helps at times uh, the important thing here is that you have no posterior rectus sheath in the the lower one third of the abdominal wall so no posterior rectus sheath below this now, the rectus abdominis muscle, we, we have talked about it already. I, I don't want to go any details on the rectus abdominis muscle. Now, uh, the external oblique muscle, these are the lateral muscles of the abdominal wall. The external oblique muscle, this, this comes like this, okay? Uh, the hands in the pocket stance, that is the, the, the position of the external oblique muscle. The, the internal oblique muscle is right opposite. So, so that, that is position of uh, the internal oblique muscles in the body. The transversus abdominis muscle. This is the, the deepest muscle in uh, the lateral compartment of the abdominal wall. And uh, this is a muscle that has, uh, that has come in, uh, into the reckoning quite a bit in recent years. Uh, this is uh, certainly a, certainly a muscle that is quite quite important both anatomically as well as functionally. Okay, the, some people call this muscle the the corset of the abdominal wall because th this is the muscle that, that provides tone to the abdominal wall. It is uh, an accessory muscle of respiration. So when, when you are caught up in a, in a, in a situation where, where you in fact need to breathe more forcibly and more frequently, this is a muscle that comes into play. And last but not the least, this muscle, uh, this in fact, uh, you know, joins the, the, the rib cage to the spine at the back, to the pelvis. So fairly important muscle, that's all I'm saying. Now, it, when you see in cross section, this is how things look like. And this is uh, uh, from our friend, uh, Professor Philip Mysoums from, uh, from Belgium. Uh, uh, surprisingly, I don't see his name in the credits here, but he's made a series of drawings like this that, 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 are, uh, that are really good to understand. Now, the rectus muscle, the anterior rectus sheath, the, the posterior rectus sheath. You can see my cursor, right, Maki? The yes. rectus muscle, the anterior, and the posterior rectus sheaths. Now, the anterior rectus sheaths is formed uh, from uh, the aponeurosis of both the external oblique and the internal oblique muscles. So, so you have a slip from the external oblique, from the internal oblique, and, and these join to form the anterior rectus sheath. 
And similarly, the posterior rectus sheath, a slip from the internal oblique muscle and a slip from the transversus abdominis muscle unite to form the posterior rectus sheath. The neurovascular bundles, these lie between the internal oblique muscle and the transversus abdominis muscle in the, the, the lateral compartment, and they enter the medial compartment by piercing the posterior rectus sheath close to the semilunar line. Okay, this here is the semilunar line. So this is where, uh, you know, things happen. Then you have fascia transversalis and of course peritoneum below. The nerve supply, the lower seven intercostal nerves, the ilioinguinal nerve, the iliohypogastric nerve, and a small part of the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. This is the nerve supply to the anterior abdominal wall. Okay, the, the, the lower seven intercostal, the subcostal nerve, the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. Nerve supply. Now the blood supply to uh, the anterior abdominal wall. Now think of the blood supply as two main supplies. The vertical supply and the lateral supply. The vertical supply comes from the inferior epigastrics, which is a branch of the external iliac artery. And the superior epigastric, which is a branch of the internal mammary artery. Okay, the vertical supply. The lateral supply comes from uh, the intercostal uh, branches of the arteries the lumbar arteries, and finally, the, the deep circumflex iliac artery, which is a branch of the external iliac artery. So vertical supply and lateral supply. Okay, the, 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 the lateral supply is segmental. And we just talked about neurovascular bundles. Now, these are the vascular bundles. These run with the cutaneous nerves and lie between uh, the internal oblique and transversus muscles. Okay, I don't want to spend your time over here. The, these are just uh, the mesh positions uh, when, when seen in relation to structures of the abdominal wall. Uh, the inlay position of the mesh that runs from, from, from well, medial margin of one rectus muscle to the other. This sort of a repair is very rarely used now. Uh, the overlay mesh from one anterior rectus sheath to the other. The, the underlay mesh, also called the intraperitoneal mesh, okay, inside from, from, from within. The retrorectus mesh, Okay, coming into vogue now with, with many surgeons in uh, the ETP repairs or the right stopper repair when done conventionally. This is a mesh that is placed between the rectus muscle and the, the posterior rectus sheath. Okay, the preperitoneal mesh uh, would be positioned between the peritoneum and the posterior rectus sheath. Okay, these are the common uh, mesh positions. Then, uh, Maki, was I on time? Yep. <laughs> right, if there are any questions, uh, 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 the ones that can be answered by, by, by me, I will answer. Otherwise, we have uh, four stalwarts waiting here. They can answer for you. Yeah, there are no questions in the Q and A, so I think we should right, proceed okay. with the the next talk, which is 
uh, me. But before I give the talk, can we have, I think that's the last lecture for the afternoon. Can we have the poll again? Yes. And then Anil, if we still have time, uh, some of the participants are requesting to post the uh, decisions regarding regarding the sliding hernia. So maybe after my talk, we could put it all back because a lot of uh, surgeons have difficulty with sliding hernia. Yeah, we, uh, we could do about 50% uh, uh, of, uh, of our uh, uh, decision making, but that's okay. I mean, that, that, that is to be expected. So no, but they are uh, yeah. So can we go to the poll and then uh, I'll give my lecture on open ventral. So I stop share from my side, right? Yep. It's, it's all yours now, Maki. So we have the poll. So the question, uh, may we ask or may we request the participants to answer, answer this. So for op open ventral hernia repair, number one, a mesh repair is almost always required. And then the second question is that the transversus abdominis muscle may be readily and easily divided. So answer the questions now, and then we'll discuss the answers before I give my lecture. Okay. Can we have the uh, answer? Okay. Uh, so very good. 75% will uh, use a mesh. Uh, and then uh, the tar, yes, 69%. So maybe we can clarify more with the, the, lectures that, the lecture that I will deliver. So I'd like to share my screen now. Okay, so my assignment would be on the, the principles of... Uh, open ventral hernia repair. And uh, these are the objectives to discuss the approach to open ventral hernia repair, discuss the different techniques, the different techniques uh, in open ventral hernia repair, discuss the results and complications of the different open techniques of the repair. So some basics, the incidence of ventral hernias, it occurs in 10% of all laparotomies. And the bigger your incision, of course, the higher the risks. Majority of the hernias that we generate are midline or median hernias. 17% are lateral, 6% are iliacs, and down the line are actually rare hernias and uh, the percentages are not much uh, bigger. Um, these are the risk factors for hernia development. There are patient factors and age, such as uh, elderly patient, plays a factor, obesity, uh, the use of immunomodulating therapy, such as chemotherapeutic drugs, steroids, and the like. Diabetes and smoking are identified factors that uh, as uh, the risk factors for developing uh, ventral hernias. Of course, surgeon's factors are also present. The suturing technique of the surgeon, the choice of the suture material, as well as the location of the incision. As in inguinal hernias, preoperative planning in uh, ventral hernias is very important. You have to do your histor history and physical exam uh, quite uh, adequately. If there's a need for abdominal wall imaging, then you have to do it. And this is mainly or usually indicated for complex hernias or you have suspicion of uh, a Swiss cheese or hernias or occult hernias, then abdominal wall imaging will certainly play a role. And I'll talk more on it uh, in the complex hernia section. Now, if you're going to choose abdominal wall imaging, CT is usually the, the choice of uh, imaging. Now you have to address the medical comorbidities of the patient, especially the cardiac and pulmonary comorbidities because when you play around with the abdominal wall, you certainly also have effects on the, um, the blood return function to the heart as well as the pulmonary function of the patient. Again, preoperative counseling is also very important. You have to discuss with the patient all of the things that might happen during your surgery. 
So for history and PE, you have to review old operative reports so that you would know or you will not be surprised with what you will see intraoperatively. If there's a previous uh, repair done, you have to know what type of repair was done, what mesh was used, the location of the mesh, where are the defects and the size of the defects. And you have to identify potential problems such as prior incisions, the presence of a stoma, the presence of exposed mesh, and skin thinning, which might uh, have uh, or cause problems during your, your closure. So let's look at imaging. As, as, as I mentioned, CT of the abdomen is very important. This will tell you the location of the hernia, the site of the previous mesh, if there is a mesh infection or collection, and most importantly, the location of the remaining musculature, which will make you decide what type of repair you're going to do. For the comorbidities, for the diabetes, it's very important that you do your sugar control. Uh, the cardiac risk has to be addressed and pulmonary problems have to be identified and you have to prepare your patient uh, pulmonary wise as well because uh, some cases of complex uh, abdominal wall repairs will have uh, pulmonary problems and you might also advise patients with pulmonary problems the possibility of ICU care after the procedure. You also have to address malnutrition because Ventral hernia repair is still a form of surgery and healing is very important. Now, what about smoking? Smoking is one factor which is identified, which is correctable. So more often than not, you have to ask your patient to cease from smoking for about a month prior to your surgery. Obesity is also a correctable factor. If your obesity can be addressed with uh, conservative means such as diet and nutrition as well as exercise, then certainly you can ask the weight of the patient to be reduced, if, especially if you're dealing with an obese patient. Some would go to the extent of doing uh, bariatric surgery first before you do the repair for the hernia because obesity certainly plays a role in terms of morbidities and recurrences. So this is a data published in 2017 showing that if you operate on smokers uh, for ventral hernia repair, there's increased mortality, morbidity, wound complications, as well as pulmonary and cardiac morbidity. And you ask the patient, as I said before, to cease from smoking for at least one month prior to the procedure. In preoperative counseling, you have to discuss the entire procedure with the patient, and you have to inform them of possible complications, such as the possibility of recurrence. We all know that there's no perfect ventral hernia operation and will always have some form of recurrence no matter how small the percentage is. Um, there's also a possibility of mesh infection, the possibility of compartment syndrome if you fail to estimate the volume of the hernia that you're going to reduce intra-abdominally. You have to advise them that if there's a need, you might uh, do post-operative ventilatory support and ICU support. And this is the most important. You have to explain the possible mesh, uh, unacceptable mesh outcomes. This is the reason why you have to explain the mesh. If you are in the US, you see all of these advertisements that says that if you have a mesh, contact me and I'll get money for you, as mentioned by, by uh, Rolf yesterday. And that's the reason why we have to explain all of these uh, mesh outcomes with the patient. Uh, Anil mentioned about anatomy. Suffice it to say that we have to be experts in the anatomy and physiology of the uh, abdominal wall, as well as know the neurovascular anatomy of the patient, especially if you're going to do muscle release uh, surgery for the, for the anterior abdominal wall. Choice of mesh. If you're dealing with an open uh, repair, then you may use an uncoated mesh a macroporous mesh. However, if the mesh is placed intra-abdominally, then you have to use a coated mesh. There are options of using a biologic or synthetic, but these are usually done if the patient that you're operating is contaminated. Just some data comparing suture and the mesh for ventral hernia repair. Certainly the mesh repair will always trump uh, suture repair with better recurrence results. Anil showed you this. These are just nomenclatures to show to you 
where the mesh is placed. This is an overlay or a subcutaneous mesh, an inlay, a retrorectus. Used to be, we call this retromuscular, but now it's retrorectus because it's beneath the rectus. Uh, beneath the posterior fascia, then you have the preperitoneal, and once you're inside, we call it the ipom or intra-abdominal. Now, where do you put the mesh? This is a study uh, published uh, 2004 comparing an overlay, an inlay, and a sublay, and the result would certainly say that the underlay will always have a better result in terms of complications, recurrences, and even late complications. So the conclusion of another study by Hulihan will also tell us that the sublay position has a better result in terms of recurrence, surgical site infection, and complication rate. And that's the reason why most operations now, whether endoscopic, ETEP, or open hernia repair, the position of the mesh is done in the sublay position. Now, there is an, uh, a paper which actually looked at watchful waiting for ventral hernia repair. This is this came from the Danish National Registry, wherein 569 patients were enrolled. And these are the results. If you do watchful waiting for incisional hernias, there is a 19% chance for surgery later on, 16% for umbilical and epigastric hernia, and the probability of emergency repair is about 4% after five years. Now, there are different choices of technique. Uh, for ventral hernia repair, you may do an anterior component, a posterior component, a simple ridge stopa repair, an IPOM or a preperitoneal only mesh. And there are other acronyms that comes down the line, such as the ETEP, the SCOLA, the TARM, and so many more. And uh, we'll just discuss the basics. This is a, an algorithm presented by Professor Yuri Nowitzki in the Colorado meeting in 2018, I think. And uh, if you can concentrate on this, these two sides, if you're dealing with an incisional hernia, what you would note is that the, big, the bigger your defect is, the chances of doing endoscopic repair is going down, such that by 8 to 12 centimeter, either you do an open reef stopa or a tar or a robotic tar. And if it's more than 12 centimeters, then there's no other option but do it open or robotic. So the laparoscopic repairs are usually... Uh, the IPOM repairs are usually at six to eight or below six to eight centimeters. Now, if you're dealing with, oops, sorry about that. If you're dealing with a recurrent hernia, if there's no mesh placed, then you go this pathway. And if there's a previous mesh, then identify where the mesh is located. If it's an onlay, then you can proceed with a lap ventral hernia repair or a robotic or open tar. If it's an underlay or a sublay, then you have to do some form of mesh excision and an open tar. And if it's a previous sublay, then you can do an open onlay or a hybrid IPOM, depending on the size of the defect. Now let's look at component separation. These are the relative contraindications for component separation. Number one, if there's an extent, extensive destruction of the components of the abdominal wall, Certainly, it would be a very difficult repair because your muscles are destroyed. Uh, when we look at the components, when the superior and inferior epigastric artery is compromised, then you also compromise the vascularity of the rectus muscle, and that will cause problems. If you have denervation injury from previous injury, then you will have muscle loss and you'll have problems as well in the repair. Uh, the other thing is that if you're dealing with a contaminated operative field, you have to consider uh, this problem because you won't be able to put a mesh and you have to look at ways how to do this primarily using your muscle release techniques. So let's look at anterior component separation. This is reported by Ramirez in 1990. The aim is to medialize the rectus and the gain that you get is about 8 to 10 centimeters on both sides. But the problem with the uh, Ramirez technique is that you do a uh, big skin flap, and this causes skin problems. So this is the technique. You do the subcutaneous flap first, then release the external oblique aponeurosis, then go in between the external and internal oblique to further medialize your rectus muscle. If this is not enough, then you can do a posterior release of the fascia so that this will medialize further. And then the mesh is placed here on top of the, or an onlay mesh is placed. So you can see here how big the defect is or the skin flap is 
and that is the externally oblique aponeurosis. Now, what is, are problems that you might encounter with an onlay mesh? Then you may have a lot of seroma due to the contact of the mesh with the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, again, with the skin flaps, wound infection, wound dehiscence, and this technique might not be suitable for large defects and you might miss multiple defects. So these are some statistics on the wound complication of the anterior component separation. They go as high as 63% and the recurrence rate can go as high as 32%. Now let's look at the posterior component separation. Oh, sorry. Now, because of the skin flap, uh, take, uh, problems with the, with the open compo anterior component separation, the endoscopic component separation was invented and this is how it will look like endoscopically. You basically release the same uh, external oblique aponeurosis and you uh, will have the medialization required without or preventing the skin complications of the open component separation. So let's go to posterior component separation or TAR. These are technical considerations published by the group of Yuri Nowitzki. If you're going to embark in the posterior component separation and TAR, the anatomy or knowledge of the anatomy is very important. The next is that you have to accurately identify the medial aspect of the rectus so that you can start the retrorectus space dissection and you can do this in two ways, the anterior approach or the posterior approach. When we say the anterior approach, you actually don't open the hernial sac and you just identify the medial portion of the rectus muscle and then incise and uh, preserve the sac as you dis dissect the retrorectus space. For the posterior approach, you do a laparotomy uh, through the hernial sac, do your adhesion lysis, and then incise the medial side of the rectus uh, through the intra-abdominal route. Of course, the advantage of this is that you would be able to uh, do adhesion lysis of the abdominal wall and uh, free the adhesions because when you do the TAR, if indeed you want to proceed with the TAR, then any bowel which is adherent to the ab anterior abdominal wall might be injured when you are mobilizing the uh, space for the TAR. The epigastric vessels and the nerves has to be preserved and I will point you later in a video where these are located. And there are peculiarities in the abdominal wall that you have to know, especially in the siphoid and the pelvic area. And you have to know how to dissect them in order to get the extensions needed for your mesh placement. So again, know where to incise the internal oblique aponeurosis while preserving the intercostal nerves. So the nerves are located here. Don't cut here. You cut uh, before the nerve. So here in this uh, uh, area, when the muscle fibers and the fascia of the transverse abdominis, this can be separated with the right angle clamp. And this is best done uh, in the more cranial portion of the patient because the muscle there is more thickened and you would be able to identify it properly. So again, let's go look at the step. This is an anterior approach. The sac is preserved. So this is the retrorectus uh, dissection. This is the rectus uh, muscle located. And once you go lateral, you would be able to identify already the, the nerves. So here, the nerves are there, the nerves are there. So when you proceed with the tar, you now incise medial to the nerves. So those, that's a nerve, that's another nerve. So you incise about one to 1.5 centimeters medial to the nerve so that you would be able to preserve the neurovascular bundle. So cranially, you can see here that the muscles are well developed and you can separate this with the right angle clamp proceeding to the tar plane. So once you are done with that, then you proceed, you can go as lateral to the psoas in uh, looking at the retromuscular dissection and then you would be able to close the midline and then subsequently put a mesh, a wide, wide mesh down from here to here if need be. Now, how far can you medialize? This is again a cadaveric study done by the Nowitzki group, Fresh Cadaver. They looked at the different steps of the TAR procedure and looked at medialization using pulleys and weights and looked at how far you would medialize after each step. 
So after retro rectus dissection, you will be able to medialize in the posterior layer 7.5 centimeters. After incision of the posterior lamina of the internal oblique, 8.3 centimeters. After transection of the transverse abdominis, a muscle, 9.5 centimeters. And then after you have done a full retromuscular dissection, then 11.2 centimeter can be advanced on just on one side. And this is the posterior layer. What about the anterior fascia? Uh, same, 7.6, 8. But after the transverse abdominis dissection and retromuscular dissection, there seems to be a little limit on the advancement of the anterior fascia, even if you do the TAR procedure. Then there, this might create problems, actually, if you're doing it with a very complex hernia. These are the results for the TAR. Moon complication can go from 6 to 25%, but the recurrence rate are actually very good to about 4 to 7%. <clears throat> so when do you do TAR? This was presented again by Alfie Carbonell in the AWR Summit in Montana in 2018. And the way he did it is to predict when to do TAR by measuring the rectus width and the defect width ratio. And the number or the magic number is that the ratio has to be equal or more than two uh, if, the, if that is the case, then TAR is necessary. Uh, then you can close the defect with a retro rectus uh, repair. This is, the, uh, uh, this is the study, which is the basis for that. They looked at CT uh, and measured the rectus width and the hernia width ratio. And they looked at the ratios. If you, the ratio is less than one, one to one per 1.49, 1.5 to 1.9, and more than two. And you would note that if it's more than two, the requirement for myofascial release are actually decreasing, such that their magic number that was derived was greater than two. So if it's greater than two, then you can be able to close the abdomen with just a rib stopa repair. However, if it's less than two, then chances are you will need some form of myofascial release in order to close the abdominal wall. This is a study uh, just to compare the posterior and anterior component separation. And this fairly recent study would just tell us that there's not much difference between the posterior component and the anterior component separation, as long as you are doing it properly and you know what you are doing. Now let's look at loss of domain. There have been several definitions for loss of domain. One is when the volume of the hernial sac and the visceral content is greater than the capacity of the abdominal cavity. These authors describe it if the defect is more than 10 centimeters, if the defect is more than 20 centimeters, but probably the most useful among all of this would be the hernial sac volume and the abdominal compartment volume ratio. And if you're HSV and ACV ratio is more than 20 to 25%, then certainly you already have loss of domain. So how do you do the HSV and ACV measurement? This is done by CT. So this is the hernial sac volume and this is the abdominal compartment volume. If it's more than 25%, then you have loss of domain. What are your options if you're dealing with loss of domain? PPP is a one. You, so you do preoperative progressive pneumoperitoneum. But the problem with PPP is that you have to admit this patient because you inject the, the air regularly and sometimes you need to put them on an ICU. And uh, the problem with PPP also as well is the, the possibility of contamination because you have to do it uh, very, in a very sterile technique. The other option is what we call chemical component separation using Botox. So you put Botox injection on the lateral muscles to try to paralyze the lateral pull of the obliques and the transverse abdominis. The other one is the use of tissue expanders and flaps. Visceral reduction is of course not very popular because that will cause contamination when you're doing your hernia repair. Some words on chemical component separation. This is a, a randomized controlled trial which looked at Injection of the Botox on the three layers, meaning the internal oblique, the external oblique, and the transverse abdominis, or just limiting the injection of the Botox from the external oblique and internal oblique. And they found out that the results of the two are not much different, such that the conclusion of this study 
is that you might actually preserve or just do Botox of the obliques and preserve the uh, transversus abdominis because the transversus abdominis actually acts as the corset of the body and it plays a role in truncal and spinal stability and abdominal wall physiology such that there might be a role for just injecting the, the obliques and not the um, transversus abdominis. This is another study looking at 37 patients with Botox injected 300 units. And these are the mean fascial defect. And uh, one of the patients just complained of pain, but most of the patients, they have no complaints at all. And using, using the Botox, the complication rate is actually comparable with other complex ventral hernia repairs. But the question now with this study is that we don't know yet what is the optimum dose for this technique. There is also ERAS for ventral hernia repair. So just take a picture of this slide. These are the protocols. So, uh, suffice it to say that with the ERAS, there are good results uh, that was achieved based on this. Uh, this is the results, this is the control. And you would note that there is an earlier recovery in terms of the flatus, in terms of uh, time to liquid and the regular diet, and uh, also um, the use of narcotics is much less. The length of stay is also much less for the ERAS protocol. And the 90-day readmission also has a better result for the ERAS pathway. This is another study which basically stays, stays the same. The ERAS protocol for ventral hernia repair has a good result uh, if you apply it. So these are the take-home messages for this talk. Onlay and sublay mesh repair are actually common. The rib stopa procedure involves the hernia defect closure and mesh in the retro rectorectus space. The primary goal of component separation is tension-free reapproximation of the linea alba. In the anterior component separation, the external oblique aponeurosis is divided, but may, this may cause lateral hernias. For the posterior component, the transverse abdominis muscle is divided to gain medialization but the most important message of it all is that proper training is required to be able to do these complex cases of ventral hernia. I think that's it. So this slide just tells us that every part would play a role, the surgeon, the patient, the wound, the hernia, and the abdominal wall. And we have to consider everything when we're doing our hernia repairs. So I borrowed this slide from Gina from um, Hopkins, uh, he calls it safer. So we have to do proper selection of our patient, anticipate and avoid problems, find the problems that will harm our patient and our results, evaluate your outcomes and do risk reduction. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Maki. That's, that, was, uh, that was perfect timing. <laughs> we finished at 4 p.m. At, at 4 p.m. my time, so that's what 6:30 p.m. your time. Yeah, Alex posted a, uh, a question in the chat: Is non-closure of the peritoneal layer in lateral abdominal wall incision a factor of incisional hernia? Uh, I know it's not. Uh, it's actually the muscle, which uh, the fascia, which is very important in the closure. The peritoneum is not a strength uh, holding uh, layer. So even though you don't close the peritoneal layer, it won't affect uh, or it won't affect the result whether you would have uh, incisional hernia. That's it, Anil. I will stop sharing this. I can't see any more questions on, uh, on my side, on my screen. So I think, Anil, do we have time? Can we put back the sliding hernia? <laughs> they are requesting uh, the sliding so. hernia. <laughs> well, if you say so, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we, we practically finished for the day, but uh, just the, the thing on the sliding hernia, let's try and go back if we can go to decision making and then go down to the Blumen sliding hernia. Incarcerated PDP, PAPP sliding. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So can you see? Yep. Right, okay. Now sliding, uh, the, the sliding hernias, now these hernias are uh, very important because here there is a real chance of doing damage. 
there, there is a real chance of doing some very bad damage to the patient if you have not recognized that this patient has a sliding inguinal hernia when you are operating. So the message is that by and large, you must try and make the diagnosis of a sliding inguinal hernia preoperatively. Okay, or at least have a strong suspicion that this patient may have a sliding inguinal hernia. And that is because, uh, because with sliding hernias, you know a significant part of the wall of the hernial sac is made up by the content of the slide. So a significant part of the hernial sac could, could be the bowel wall. A significant part of the hernial sac could be uh, the bladder, for example. So the first message is to, to, to a diagnose preoperatively wherever you can. Now, now, this is how they in fact look like. You know, you, you try and reduce them. They might reduce for a while, but then they slowly come back to, to their normal positions. Now, this I am just showing you a view of TEP repair being done for a slide. Now, I am showing you these clippings because I want you to know, like we have been saying from the very beginning, that for difficult hernias, use the TAPP approach that is safer. Now, this patient has a slide. You can see that. You know, holding that that side. Now, th this is not this is not a correct hold because you might be holding bowel. Uh, the surgical principle is to go right to the apex of the hernia, and then then if I reduce it from there. Okay, so so go right to the apex. You must know it is a slide so that you do not try to open the hernial sac. If you try and do that, which is open the hernial sac, you may injure bowel or bladder or whatever the content is. So that was a, a view of a TEP being done for a slider. But what I want to show you is this that for a sliding hernia, again, a TAPP is a much better option for the simple reason that you can, that you have more control, that you can see the slide. Like here, you can see the, the slide under direct vision. You can reduce it safely again under direct vision. You see, there you go. In a TEP, you can't do this. In a TEP, you, you, you can't see this well, but in a TAPP, you, you can first of all view the contents. You can secondly reduce the contents under direct vision. And thirdly, you can, can finally inspect the contents of the hernial sac that have been reduced to make sure you, you've not done any damage. So this is what, what I wanted to uh, say to you, that again, for a sliding hernia, as far as possible, you must diagnose preoperatively, have a, a strong you know, suspicion for a slide, you know, even when you are not diagnosed preoperatively. And thirdly, that the TAPP approach would be a much safer and a better option for a sliding hernia. Okay, that, that was my message of a sliding hernia. So if there are uh, you know, any more questions that, that, uh, that we can take, we'll do it now. Otherwise, we would call it a day for day two. So if you do have any questions, maybe you can you can put them in into the chat box now, or uh, uh, Rolf will then finally uh, declare us closed for today. Any other questions from the participants? I don't see any in the chat box. 
oh, okay. the Q and A. So maybe we can uh, call it a day and we see all of them again tomorrow. I think so. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Anil and uh, Maki, for for this excellent session. Um, definitely, I think uh, the participants have been uh, listening attentively to your last lecture, Maki, because it is a very complex uh, topic and a very um, fast developing topic. If I recall, we started to to evaluate these procedures only two, three years ago. And if I look at my own hospital, we are doing this now by robotic surgery. So it is a tremendous development and really an exciting field of abdominal wall uh, surgery. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your patience. We are more or less on time. Uh, after two and a half hours now, everybody is most probably hungry. So I wish you a nice afternoon or evening, uh, respective uh, where you are sitting. In the Philippines, it will be a dinner. For us here, it will be a lunch. So um, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Rolf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye-bye, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye. Oh, I'm here. Have a good rest. Oh, okay. Linda. Hello, Linda. Hi, Ma. Selamat sore. Apa kabar? Apa kabar? Apa kabar? Baik, Pak. Baik. Thank you, ya, Linda. Sudah di webinar. Iya. Oke. Para mit selamat, Bu. What to do after we touch on the left foot of the couch? So I did that on the left. What to do after we...